Charlie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So what is it that you do at Mordor Gum Dogs? Our core business is we breed Labradors, Springer Spaniels and Cocker Spaniels, all of working uh, breeding, all of working strain. We keep probably the majority of them. So we sell some as puppies, we keep the majority of them and we train them for people who want a um, who want a sort of ready to go dog uh, that that behaves impeccably and does what it says on the tin um, without having to go through the puppy stage. Um, we also do uh, one-to-one lessons for people just wanting to train their own dog. Uh, some of those are our are, are dogs that we sold them as puppies and others are just the dogs they got from somewhere else. Um, we do um, what I call boarding school for dogs. So people who, who buy, a, buy a puppy with the intention to train it or, 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 uh, or just with the intention to have a puppy and then get someone else to train it. And they send them here for, for, for boarding school, like a minimum of a month um, and upwards. Some people's dogs come for a long period of time because they want them to be really good. We do quite a lot of demonstrations, like corporate demonstrations, public demonstrations. So like country fairs and, and things like that, game, game fairs. And also uh, the corporate thing would be more along the lines of uh, one that we did recently was, was Yamaha of the USA brought their top salespeople over to Scotland. They stayed in, you know, fancy hotel in Edinburgh and went and had like a Scottish experience kind of thing. And we, we, <laughs> we, we became part of that. Scott, we, you know, we become part of that. So we turn up with 15, 16 dogs ranging from a puppy right through to a, not eight, nine year old dog, and we show them all the training, and we work a group of dogs together, and uh, just to sort of give them a, a feel for like what you can achieve with a dog. Basically, it's kind of, I mean, the way I look at it, it's a bit of a sales pitch, um, but we we do get paid to do it, so it's more for the people's point of view, the v- viewer's point of view. It's more like a kind of aspirational thing. So it's like watching um, a really, really good, uh, you know, cricketer or skier or whatever. And going, you know, that's that, that's what I want to be like. That's what I want to achieve. And even if you never quite get as good as them, you're like setting your setting your standard. And I wouldn't want to compare myself to some epic sports personality, but but it's just to give you because I'm definitely not. But just to give you one of those sort of things, one of those kind of comparisons. I have this thing. It's called like the dinner party test. So if someone asks you at a dinner party what oh, your occupation is, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm generally like I'm a, a joiner or something. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Exactly that. I'll sit down. Like, what do you do? Uh, and the problem is now because I'm sort of, I've been doing it for so long. It's quite often like, oh, you're Charlie. Oh, great. Now my dog. I'm like, oh. <laughs> my, my wife won't. Walk, my wife won't walk around any of these events with me. Like, we're going to a charity dinner on Thursday, and she will literally walk in the door. She'll go one way. I'll go the other. Because she'll like, you'll just be stop, stop, stop. All these people that know you that you've trained dogs for. She's like, oh, I'm off. Um, because yeah, exactly. The dinner party thing is, is that's basically what I spend my entire life at a dinner party. And then I get to the end, I think, God, I'm boring people with dogs again. And it's like, no, no, they started, they started. <laughs> so it's quite unusual. Do you actually find then it's a double edged sword though at these dinner parties of people just treating you as their agony aunt of, oh, my dog's doing this. Why isn't it in that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, I, I, I feel for doctors because I bet they, <laughs> they get the same. You know, I, they go to dinner and they're like, oh, you're a doctor. Oh, no, I've got this thing. I'm like, oh, God, leave me alone. No, I, but I, the difference is, I guess, is that I love it. So I'm, as soon as they give me a window to start chatting, I'm then like, about dogs. And and then my wife's like, you just spoke about dogs all evening, didn't you? I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And she goes, you know, some people might not want to do that. And I'm like, I know, they kind of get the short straw if they sit next to me. And I try and turn the conversation on, around onto them and say, what do you do? And they go, oh, I'm an accountant for HMRC. And you're like, oh, okay. Uh, and I say, well, so how's that? And they're like, compared to your life, really shit. So let's talk about yours. So, so you know, it's, 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 it's tricky because, because it, it is what it is. And, you, you know, it is completely, my life and job is completely all-consuming. Like I just, I live, breathe. I am part dog, according to my wife. You know, I'm just, that's what I'm like all the time. So to go somewhere and just be like, I'm not at work. I'm going to switch off. It's just not something I can do. Because how many dogs are you currently housing at Mordor at the moment? Um, a lot. A lot. So a lot of dogs, which probably require... Oh, my, my aunt, when people say, how many dogs have you got? I, I kind of... There's a, there's a number of reasons I don't ask the question, answer the question properly. And it's not because I'm trying to be a politician. It, it's It's kind of... To me, it's kind of like, well... 
you know, sometimes we can have a lot of dogs because we've maybe got three litters of puppies and they've all had eight puppies. And suddenly you go, right, there's eight puppies and their mums. And you're like, that's pushing 30 dogs. And it's just three of them really to us. So I never say the number. And I basically, my answer to everyone is probably more than anyone else you've ever met. Um, but until someone comes and they see like how well looked after they are and things, well, I wouldn't, I don't want people to sort of think they're kind of like some sort of like just sort of crazy kennel where there's just dogs everywhere and dog shit everywhere. And it's just a bloody mess. Like our, our place is, I like, I, I pride on the fact this it's immaculate. You come up the drive and the grass is all neat and you won't find a dog mess anywhere. And you know, it's all tidy and the dogs only bark when they're getting out for a run or, or whatever. They're not just in there barking and howling all the time. And it's sort of very organized. So I just feel like giving someone a number is a sort of, it gives them sort of pre conceived ideas, but it's more than 25. So that's, you know, that's kind of, Okay, so a lot of dogs. So how then, when you go away, say on a ski holiday, are you able to leave them? Yeah, what, uh, what, what strategy? So it place? used to be really hard, but now I've got an awesome team of people. We are, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't really know because I kind of do my own thing and don't really get involved with anyone else who does what we do or even kind of, there aren't really many people who do what we do. But most people who sort of train dogs especially as sort of working dogs gun dogs and stuff are maybe like a a keeper who gamekeeper who does it as a sort of side hustle or um or someone who you know someone who does it as a as a side deal so they've only got a few dogs there's there's really no one who does it not many people who do it full time and those that do are kind of it's like a husband wife team um and they've maybe got like someone who works in the kennels whereas we've got we've got a team of 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 half a dozen trainers working for me so, so I can walk out the door and know that they're in good shape because these guys are up here every day anyway. I basically, in the past, I didn't used to, it was impossible. Like I remember asking my sister to come and house sit for me once and she literally uh -huh. I walked back and she was like, the moment you walked out the door, they barked the whole time. The moment you walked back in, they were zipped up. They were like, oh, dad's home. We've got to behave. And she was like, I'm never, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> and that one, luckily that, that one, that one trip away, that one week away that my sister did do that. It was worthwhile because it was the, it was the trip away I met my wife on. Um, <laughs> so, so if my sister hadn't done that, I wouldn't have met my wife. How did you get into the business? Uh, too stupid to do anything else. <laughs> um, but surely, it's, 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 that must have started somewhere. And then did, did you always think, oh, I'll, I'll have it as a full-time job? Or was it always just a passion <laughs> that kind of grew? Yeah, so, so it was funny. I was interviewed by someone... Uh, a friend of mine from school's dad interviewed me. He was doing a talk at Oxford, and at, which is where he was at uni. And he was doing a talk on kind of how people, he was particularly talking about like entrepreneurial type people, how they start and at what point do you see people who are going to be successful? So he's like, you know, can you see someone aged 10, 12 becoming a successful person? Can you see someone aged 18, 19? Can you see someone aged 25? Uh, and he wanted to speak to me because I do a, like a very different thing to kind of most of his son's kind of friend to all of his son's friends. And he made me really think about, about some of the, some of the situation. Like when I was, when I was really young, all I was interested in was the dogs. I would be regularly asleep curled up in the dog bed. We had dog, we had like a, an old sort of curved staircase and I would always be underneath the staircase curled up in the dog bed. As soon as I was old enough to have an opinion, I said to my parents, could my bedroom be downstairs? Because we were all slept upstairs and the dogs weren't allowed upstairs. So I said, well, if I can move downstairs, then maybe I can have the dogs in my room. So my mum said, yeah, fine. And she used to kind of cleared out kind of a utility sort of sewing room, like where the cat got fed. This sort of slightly random room in the house. <laughs> and we turned it into we turned it into my bedroom so that when it, the dogs could sleep in the in the in in my bedroom and I was away I went to boarding school my dad was in the military he was in the army and um so I went away to boarding school quite young and uh all, all my letters home that I wrote was all just how are the dogs what are the dogs doing where are the dogs been doing <laughs> so I didn't really think about that until probably a couple of years ago when this chat spoke to me but basically I've always been sort of slightly because I thought it was normal um but it obviously wasn't normal I mean I remember the name uh, 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 a, a of a client of mine whose son was at school with me i remember the name of their cocker spaniel puppy that they got when we were eight nine um and i probably only met the dog a handful of times but i also remember he had an overshot bottom jaw so his 
bottom teeth sort of came out too far and he's called Bertie. And, you know, they are like, they're like, how do you remember that? And I was like, to me at the time, again, it was just sort of, well, why wouldn't I remember? I remember the, some other friends, some cousins of theirs who had a black Labrador was called Hovis. And it was just like, I just remember, but they were such a big part of my life when I didn't really realize that it weren't such a big part of everyone else's life. So then fast forward to, I was 18. We lost our, one of our family spaniels that my dad rescued out of a block of flats in a nearby slightly ropey kind of village near where we grew up. And it was one years old and it could fit through a cat flap. Okay. So, I mean, it was pretty skinny and tiny and she became my best pal and she died age 14 when I was 18. And I said to my parents, could I get a trained gun dog? Because I got into kind of shooting a little bit. I had a friend with a gun dog and I thought that'd be quite fun. And I said, we could share it. And I was going to uni quite close by where I, where I grew up. So I got this, this inverted commas trained gun dog and he was awesome. He was a lovely dog, but blooming willful wasn't he was trained in some ways but really wasn't in other ways in the first day shooting he just took off like through the line and like was about to ruin the drive and the keeper managed to I managed to stop the dog and the keeper was like get on a plumbing lead and I was like right I need to learn how to properly train this so I read books and watched videos and did all the stuff that you know people are probably doing via me now like watching my YouTube channel and stuff I would have just absorbed you know, if I hadn't found myself incessantly irritating, I'd have absorbed all of my own content kind of thing. Um, and then he turned into an awesome dog. And then I, a friend said, can I help with their dog? And another friend and another friend, another friend. And that was, it, it sort of evolved like that. And I woke up one morning and I was like, God, this is kind of almost like a business. And I guess the other driving factor was that my mother probably won't listen to this, but uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll, Put her to blame but my my mother's quite prone to to sort of um squashing any kind of enthusiastic ideas i ever had um so she said, can't train dogs i mean that's what gamekeepers do or whatever you've got a university degree you know need to go and be a a lawyer or a banker or 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 you know something like that work for a company that i've heard of she was that's her kind of mentality um so that because i was always going to join the army so she had that in her mind and then i changed my mind and so when I said I was going to train dogs, she was like, oh, you can't do that. So that immediately made me think, I'm going to do it. Um, and then a couple of years later, one of her friends with a sort of similar mentality was like, oh, are you, are you still doing that dog thing? I was like, yeah, and I live in a bigger house than you do, kind of. You know? <laughs> but yeah, and it's, you know, I was just sort of, I'm quite kind of driven by people who, who have sort of said you can't do something. And I'm a big fan of saying to anybody, young people or whatever, my kids, if you put your mind to it put in that extra effort and extra time you can and that's basically how it evolved um and you know there's element of luck but there's also that lucky people make their own luck you know if you sit on your bum luck's not going to come your way whereas if you're out there running around luck's going to hit you um and so it just evolved and more and more people came to me helping wanting help with their dogs then i started to sell the odd dog i trained and and then it morphed into kind of just selling as much much more into just selling like ready trained dogs because that's just the most effective efficient best way that people can get what they're looking for you're saying how much the business has grown and it really actually has gone global because you have clients from all over the world what is it that they're looking for that they can't find in their respective countries it's funny people ring me up they go oh, i'm in i'm in gloucestershire you know it's quite far away and i'm like i've just sent a dog to the south island of new zealand and one to north of the arctic circle in alaska you're, you're pretty close kind of thing um, why do these people come from far away? I guess, <laughs> I guess there's a kind of inherently I'm riding on the back of, there's an element of, you know, we sort of invented the gun dogs to a certain extent, you know, Labradors and Spaniels and like, they really kind of, it really sort of started in the, you know, well, they, Labradors did start in the UK. Um, so, so, um, we've got this kind of hereditary, like, well, we've been doing it longer than all of you. You know, Britain sort of rides on the back of that. And I think it's great, you know, rural Britannia type, like, you know, kind of perception. The rest of the world is like, oh yeah, I had a great grandfather who was English or I had a great, great, great something who was from the from Ireland. You know, there's always that sort of, like, you know, people with less history, like the Americans and Australians things, you know, the, the, the sort of expats from many, many generations ago, I've got that sort of draw back to the UK. You know, they love coming over here for the sort of history. And, and, and I guess, you know, we have a good reputation globally, not we as in Mordor Gun Dogs. We as in Britain have a good reputation globally for having the best dogs in the world. 
And it's very, very rare that you hear of people bringing dogs in from abroad, but you see a lot of people sending dogs out of the UK. So that that's kind of instantly a help. It's just perception by other people. Now, I don't think it's just a dreamy perception. I think it's true as well. Having seen dogs all over the world, I think we do have better Labradors and Spaniels than than anyone else around the world, as in as a country. And I think then we've just made the effort of becoming, trying to be the best at what we do within the UK. And that's then seeped into kind of abroad. Um, and And I think the other thing that's helped me is that I'm basically selling dogs to people who like kind of would be my friends. Um, and the, what I mean by that is maybe people who, who a lot of my friends from sort of my school days and things lead a life of the type of people I'm selling dogs to. So therefore I kind of know them, uh, you know, inherently know them and know what they're, what they want. And, and they don't necessarily want a dog that can stop on a whistle at 500 meters. They want a dog that's just a really great family dog and, can pick a few pheasants and ducks and, and, you know, and it's just getting that kind of that balance. And so we focus a lot more on like the family pet side of it that I'd say most other people do who are just like, Oh, it won this competition or it is doing that. And it's like, if you want a dog that's going to win competitions, we, we always say, we're not, don't come to us. Cause we're not, we don't compete with our dogs. Could they run in competitions? Yeah. But I'm not consistently running them and consistently winning to say to people, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll produce you a dog that's going to become a, field trial champion that's just not my market my market is i want a really lovely family dog who i can take shooting on a saturday i'm like that's us because that's what i do with my dogs they lie around in the kitchen and i go shooting on a saturday if i've been invited or whatever you know that's so that's so i know how that life works and what's going to be expected of them do you think the gun dog industry is slowly dying out especially with the the recent heat in the press over the last few years about driven shooting and especially in the northeast with a lot of the grouse moors closed, I know that a couple of breeders there are sort of having to diversify in, instead of just being solely gun dogs, then they're going into uh, sniffer dogs, etc. Is the key to it just continue to diversify as you do? Or do you see as an overall trend of gun dogs going down? I think the days of someone just having a gun dog who, you know, go back, go back 50 years. And like my dad's friends who who were kind of, maybe had a shoot or something, you know, they'd have a gun dog, it probably lived in a kennel at best. It lived in the boot room. They were a bit more kind of, you know, the mentality that maybe not, not all, I don't want to put anyone in a box, but a bit more the mentality that these days might, you might more expect of a gamekeeper or a shepherd. The dogs are a part of their job. They live in a kennel. They come out when they're needed for their job. The quad bikes in the next door shed, you know, the beaters trailers in the next door shed, and they're all in their place. They're all looked after. They're not, what we see them as today and i think go back 50 plus years and there was much more of oh they're a gun dog well they don't come in the house they're not a family dog then it, it just it just wasn't two things weren't connected whereas now the gun dog bit is such a minor detail i mean i've got a client who maybe goes shooting 80 days a season okay which is a lot a lot for anyone you know is listening who you know isn't isn't sort of in this kind of but that's a lot i mean that is twice as much as someone who thinks they have a good time this is a but that 80 days it's like well of the 365 days of the year morning and evening it's in the house lunchtime it might even be in the house it's a pretty minor part of their year I and mean, that's a guy who's doing it a lot so most people are doing 10 12 days out it's just a drop in the ocean to the rest of the year where the dog's in the house it's going for a walk with the wife and kids going to the beach going to the pub and i guess so we focus so much more on that that the gun dog bit is, is yeah we love doing it but it's really just a sort of it's a sort of side hustle for the dog almost. And their main job, their main role is to be a good family family member and, and behave as, as such. So do I think the I think the I think like everything, I think it's the kind of uh to quote someone I listen to a podcast a lot, you know, it's if you don't innovate, you evaporate. So we train dogs for people who who who've got um who've got autism or, or they've got a kid with autism or something. And they're, they're, we're not saying, Oh yeah, we're going to produce you a specialist dog. We're just like, we're just producing you one of our gun dogs, but it'll suit your role as well as it'll suit the guy who wants to take it shooting because it's just a really well-behaved dog. Who's calm can handle any situation and just not give you any grief. And when you need a hug, it'll give you a hug kind of thing. So um, yeah, so I guess that that's kind of, um, that's the sort of, but the, the training them to be a really good gun dog is still like, that's, that's at our heart. That's what we love doing. 
but we're aware that that's just not for everybody. So, are you able to get out shooting at all in amongst all of your training, or even picking up? Uh, what yeah. balance are you around the garden training the dogs, and what uh, are you able to sort of get out in the field with them? So, um, I used to do a lot out on the shoots, like either out shooting or work, or out picking up and beating and things. I slightly let my team have that as it were because that's fun that's really you know everyone loves doing that like putting all the work in throughout the year and then in September October November December whatever going out on the shoot with a really lovely team of dogs that you've created so the guys that work for me get out um you know once a week once or twice a week kind of thing I tend to just go out when I'm going shooting so maybe invited by a friend or a client or or something that I've organized or whatever and I tend to just sort of I do that bit and I'll, I'll still take a team of dogs. So I have this sort of sort of uh, head knock with my wife as, as, as <laughs> anyone does. Oh, I'm going shooting at a weekend. And she's like, well, you were off shooting. I was like, yeah, but I took nine dogs with me. Like, I, like eight of them were dogs in for training. Like the, you know, those, those eight dogs needed to go out on a shoot. Like, yeah, I had fun doing it, but I have fun every day. Like that's the joy of my, I mean, I call it a job. It's not really a job. Um, we're having a laugh about this the other day. <laughs> Come on to that in a second, but but it's not really you know I, I, that's my every day. You know I'm going out with dogs. I'm walking dogs. I'm messing around with dogs. It's like yeah, so I go sh- I go out on a shoot, but I'm 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 there with often with clients um, or potential clients, and I'm there with dogs that I'm working with. It's very very rare. Like I don't think it happened last season where I go out with just maybe three of my own dogs, and I just have a nice day where I just tune out and relax. There's always an there's always an ulterior motive because that's just the way my brain works. I mean, my wife and I be going out to dinner and I'll be like, we need to leave 15 minutes early because we're dropping a dog on the way. And she's like, okay, you know, um, I mean, it, it makes it a tax, de- tax deductible dinner party, but, but, um, you know, <laughs> but, but basically that's how my mind's working all the time. Always like, Oh, I could take that dog and drop that off on the way or I'll, I'll you know, I'll collect that dog from, here on my way back from there or whatever you know so if I'm on a shoot I wouldn't just it's very hard for me to go there and I could I'm always thinking oh I could have that dog with me because that dog could just do with an extra day out or whatever so so I do get out maybe maybe a dozen times a year um and I, and then we are just immediately around our sort of little farm and kennels and stuff we we we're always you know we're always doing stuff with game and things we're, we're you know there's bits and bobs going on all the time in terms of just little rough days and stuff like that in your, all of your years of shooting, what's the most amount of dogs that you've had with you sitting on peg? 16. 16. <laughs> it was, um, the reason I know it's 16, because I remember the day because they did it on purpose. It was, um, it was, a, it was a group of friends. Um, it was a group of friends on one of our friends' sort of family farm. It, it became a sort of running joke. The longer I did this for, the more dogs I kept turning up with. Because when I first did it, I'd maybe come with three or four, and everyone was like, Wow, you know, Charlie's got three or four dogs behaving, and then it became five or six. Then I, then I, you know, regularly went picking up with a dozen dogs, um, and uh, and I had the the privilege of picking up quite regularly for probably one of the most famous families in the world, um, and um, if not the most famous <laughs> in the world. And and I used to be called. I, he used to he used to call me the boss. Used to call me the 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 dog carpet guy. Because basically my dogs just looked like a carpet. We just hoovered up over the over the over his grouse mall. We just sort of um we just hoovered up at the back of everybody. Um and, and I used to get this, oh Charlie, could you just could you just come over here? I, I, I just need you to head over there because there's something to be picked or whatever. Um and that was always, yeah, I mean regularly twelve plus dogs. Um, but this one particular shoot, I took 16 just because I was like, well, it's a mate shoot. We're only going to see about 10 pheasants. And it was just a bit of banter. And what I ended up doing was having some of them with me. And then I went and sat one on everyone else's peg. <laughs> and then I, and then I back gunned, I then stood behind and they sat on everyone else's peg. And actually to give some of my friends due who, who, who are quite sort of doggy orientated. And a couple of them have got dogs sort of really descendants of my dogs and things now. They were, they were then, they were like, great. And they would then start working the dog at the end of the end of the shoot and got their dog to pick up and things. But most of them, the dogs just came off back to me. And, and, uh, but it was a quite a funny, uh, but it was sort of pre kind of predated iPhones and things. So there wasn't any video footage or it was just sort of something in a, you know, it's just something that will be in my memory, I guess. Do you think it's a shame with the amount of 
people who now head out without a dog on a shooting day, especially on sort of the, the pay to shoot days. No one's bringing a dog because no, no one wants to hassle them. And it's often lamented in the field sports media about the fact that yeah. the amount of dogs that people have on a shoot really is deteriorating. Yeah, I think it's a real. I think it's a real shame. I mean, I've had so many people who I've trained dogs for who got a dog to accompany them on a shoot and then became someone who went shooting because they wanted to take their dog. Does that make sense? So they they yeah. they transfer from a shooting person to a dog person, and they would quite happily put their gun down and just go and work their dog. Um, and so I think people who are only going out on a shoot, not taking a dog because they think it's a hassle are missing out on at least 50% of the joy of going out on a date. I guess it's a hassle because people buy a dog and don't train it and then it doesn't work. Um, and I think people are pretty short sighted in that way. And, and, uh, so, you know, my answer is give me a shout and I'll sell you a trained one. Um, and it'll be more, <laughs> it'll be more enjoyable, but, um, the mindset of the people who are running shoots and going to shoots, maybe there's definitely like a miss, a mismatch. I see a lot of people who go to a shoot with a dog and they get really annoyed because there is no organization and there's no kind of, this is what is right. And this is what is allowed. And this is how we run it. Um, in terms of, you know, they turn around at the end of the drive and there aren't any birds to pick. Um, and the pickers up are like, well, we're here to work our dogs and the, and the guns should be shooting the birds. And they're like, well, they're here. To... And my view is if the guys, the, whoever the guys are, if they're either or girls, but whoever the people are who are paying to be there or someone is paying. So, you know, that's the basis of it, whether you're paying or whether your mate is paying or whether it's your mates owns the shoot or whatever. Someone is right scratching out a check for this pretty expensive hobby. So my view is, is, is if the person who is either paying or being paid for wants to come along count daisies and just pick up work his dog most of the day that's his call and that is nothing to do with the pickers up or the keeper that's between him and his host and if his host finds it annoying he won't invite him back but it's his it's his deal for pickers up to stand at the back and kind of go um oh he should be concentrating on his shooting it's like he should be doing just what he likes uh you know a, a waiter in a restaurant who brings you out a lovely a lovely sort of flaming yards, you know, steak, you know, like a beautiful bit of steak or, you know, whatever. It's not for him to say, are you not going to finish it? <laughs> and then start finishing your steak for you. It's up to you. You've paid for it. Yeah, it's a bloody waste. And it's not what they would do, but that's got nothing to do with them. And I think it's a real shame because I think with a little bit of leadership from the owner of the shoot and the keep, the head keeper, it could all just be, organized in a way that everybody was happy and we we ran a really lovely shoot with a friend next door to us here for a number of years and it was just so simple and there was just simple rules if a gun's got a dog don't pick up his birds just pick up his wounded ones um and then at the end go and sweep up behind anyway just to make sure they haven't missed anything even if a gun hasn't got a dog don't pick up things around their feet because it's bloody off-putting if you're standing there with a gun and a dog's running around your feet and a guy's at the back going Ben, Ben, come here, Ben, come here. It's like, oh God, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to concentrate. I'm not good enough to concentrate on that and concentrate on not the stepping on the dog and concentrate on not listening to the guy whistling behind me. Um, and I think it's just like, like anything, it's just sort of, and I'm sure I get lynched for saying it's sort of lack of training and people just sort of turning up and watching what other people do and the other people that do it don't run it in, you know, don't know how to do it. And it's like, it's like when, it's like how you walk, how you walk between drives carrying your gun. You know, there's a way you do it, and you you learn how to do it because someone else tells you. But you can see people who aren't haven't learned the same way, not doing it in the way. And I'm like, oh God, could you unload your? Could you break your gun or could you put it in its sleeve, or whatever? And they're like, oh, it's unloaded. I'm like, well, I don't know that. So there's just a sort of a lack of training, I guess. And I think it's it puts people off taking a dog because they're like, well, I take my dog and I don't get to do anything, so it's a bit of a waste of time, but frustrating for the dog. And I think there's a big market for a huge market for people who, you know, people who are sort of struggling to sell day shooting and, you know, that or, or not necessarily struggling, but they're trying to make themselves different from everyone else. I mean, there's an easy solution to me. And that is we are the guns dog friendly shoot. Turn up to our shoot with your dog. Our pickers up will do their job, but, you know, quietly and effectively without bothering you. And and then the, you'll have a team of pickers up who want to control their dogs and not just have them running around everywhere. Um, and and I think there's a there's a definitely a, a big market for that because I would be one of those people to go. I would enjoy that. And I've 
I've fallen out with pickers up over the years a couple of times when I've been a gun and also when I've been another picker up and I've clearly seen the gun getting frustrated and I've seen people asking the pickers up not to pick up their birds very politely at the beginning of the day and then not getting a response from it and then it's like well it's like you know it's just it's just extraordinary and it's like we're all going to be in this together so to kind of like run it like that is you know it's it's kind of um you know, difficult. And then from the gun doggy side of you, there's also a different angle. There's like, we're, we're the not, we're not the dog friendly shoot. Don't bring your dog because our pickers up don't get paid. They actually pay to be here because they're training their dogs and they can then do precisely what they like. And the guns get a, you know, a cheaper day or something because the, because the pickers up, are, it's more like a training day. So, you know, there's lots of angles. And I think people need to like everything, you know, it, it, I said a minute ago, you need to innovate or evaporate. And I think there's a huge, uh, call for that and I and I it's it's on my list of things that I I've got you know I've just got too big a list at the moment and that's probably the the one that would that, that definitely won't make any money kind of thing um but otherwise that would be on my that's on my list of I want to have a shoot my own shoot again that I run on that basis <laughs> that's brilliant if, if we ask some puppy training slash dog training questions on a rapid yeah. fire basis Gun dog trainers use slip leads. Should all other dogs use slip leads? I would never tell someone what to use. I would tell them what I use and why I use it. Um, I think a slip lead is an effective way to train a dog how to walk to heel. Um, and they're also really easy because you just you don't have to mess around. You see people trying to get the clip on their dog. And they're sort of fiddling around with the dog and the dog's fidgeting. Whereas you can literally, if you get good at it with a bit of practice, you can literally lasso your dog from about a meter away and fling the lead, the leads on, we're done. Um, um, and, you know, then when it comes off, it's just in your pocket, one size fits all. And they are an effective way to, to, to train a dog to, to walk to heel. But you can also do it with a lead and collar, uh, you know, as uh, pretty well as well. I mean, so we use, we use slip leads. It's the only thing we have here. It's the only thing we would, tell people to buy it's the only thing we supply with our dogs um but i would never say to someone oh get that collar off you shouldn't be using that because that's not true um it's just that's what we prefer a lot of people especially uh newer owners of dogs will put harnesses on their dogs to go out for a walk what do you make of that <laughs> i'm putting a, for anyone listening i'm putting a, i'm putting my fingers together and making a gun sign and pointing it up to my temple so my my exp simple explanation for this um, is, uh, and you don't look like you're old enough, but uh, I am. And anyone who's my age, who grew up in the 80s and early 90s watching Blue, watching Blue Peter, um, you'll remember a guy called Jeff Capes, who's equivalent to, who's the chap now, not Mr. Beast, the YouTube guy, the Beast, the, the English bodybuilder, weightlifter, strongman. And he calls himself the, be the, the Beast or something. Anyway, um, but Miss Jeff Capes was like Britain's strongman, and he used to pull. Watch into my YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to to try and make my channel better. Um, uh, Jeff Capes was <laughs> Britain's strongman, and he tried to he pulled buses and jumbo jets and things like with his brute force. Um, and I always say to people, when when he did that, what did they? What did he wear? He wore a harness because he the thing went round his shoulders. He could get his whole body into it, clip it on middle of his back. And he was off and then he could, you know, pull his entire force behind him, behind him. If he did that with something around his neck, I mean, he literally would have had to be Superman because it just wouldn't physically be possible. Now, that's not to say that we want to break the dog's neck. But what it is to say is that if you put a harness on a dog, you are putting them in the perfect situation to pull their heart out at, and giving them all the support everywhere they need it and and enabling them to do it. So so people go, oh, I'm worried about a slip lead because I'm worried about hurting my dog. So I put them on a harness and they don't. And then I'm like, well, what about your shoulder? Because that dog that's only, you know, 10 kilos is going to weigh 35 kilos and you're going to have shoulder surgery. You're becoming an enabler of your dog being pulling on a lead. So um, are there are there places, are there sort of situations where I would like have, you know, there are situations where I would have, um, you know, slightly different ideas on that. So if you're training a dog to be a sniffer, a tracker dog, 
it's slightly different. You would still train them to walk heel on a slip lead. You would still train them to behave. And then when they put their harness on, that's almost like their uniform. And as they put it on, and we've done this with sort of with tracking dogs and deer and you, and pe- people tracking dogs as well. You you put the harness on and they almost step forward into it. And they're like, I've got my harness on. I'm off to work. And then as soon as the harness comes off again, they're like, oh yeah, I walked to heel. Um, so it's just about how they, it's just about doing it the right way. But for 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 an average pet to be on a harness, no. Um, I think it's a terrible idea um, because it gets the dog into the habit of pulling. So, um, but I've got a YouTube video of me throwing one in the bin. So there you go. <laughs> Anything for the content. You yeah, also yeah. did a YouTube video about why you shouldn't walk your dog. Surely yeah. a lot of people think oh, that's quite a counterintuitive there, Charlie. What do you mean by yeah, when yeah. you say you shouldn't walk your dog? <laughs> one, well, one, one of the comments, one of them, I've had a few comments. Most of the comments I get on my YouTube video, YouTube channel are great really positive people still saying thanks very much is so helpful and then you always get a few that aren't and we've had some absolute corkers one of them i think it was to that 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 um video was was just this guy's an idiot which i just thought was <laughs> um i just thought that was fantastic that someone someone would just wrote this guy's an idiot i'm like i love i love that i think that's fab um but um what i what i what i meant by that was um and if you, you know, in the video, it sort of does, does, I do kind of elaborate. But what I, what I meant by that was if you, um, if you, everyone has this preconceived idea that it's a dog, it needs walking. So the first thing they do, especially with like working breeds, gun dogs, you know, of all breeds, they're like, oh, it's a spaniel. It needs lots of exercise. Um, and so all they do is they instantly take their dog out and completely overexpose it to so many environments, so many different things without having any 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 rules or any control over them. So they're putting them in these situations that the dog just isn't capable of dealing with. Um, and we always uh, we always use the when we're explaining dog training to someone, we always use um, we always use learning to drive as the uh, as the exact as one of the examples. And the reason we do that is because most people who've got a dog have learned to drive. So it's kind of something they can remember to, remember and, and and relate to. So if you if you buy a 17 year old um uh, you know a Porsche 911 and you let them loose on it you know what do you think is going to happen yeah there's there's quite there's a few of them i'm sure who might not even get in it because they'll be like oh my god i don't i don't trust myself or or i'm scared or whatever but there's going to be quite a lot of boys and i would have been one of them that would have been like cool and bang smash you know dead seriously injured written off car you know there's nothing good is going to come of that okay um, and that's what happens with people with their, and particularly we see these days, cocker spaniels. Um, uh, they go out into the woods or into the field and they just let their dog go. And it is literally like handing the key. And this is an untrained dog. This is a six month old dog um, or, or, an eight, or a 10 month old dog. It doesn't really matter. But they've normally started when they're quite young and they, they take their dog out and they let them go. And then they just sort of hope it's all going to work. And it's like, well, what? That's like handing a keys to a Porsche 911 to a 17 year old and hoping it's going to work. Well, fingers crossed they come back alive, you know, and that it's just, so don't do it. And and so don't hand the keys to the kid until they've learned how to drive and they're really, really efficient. Don't hand the freedom to the dog until they've learned how to behave and they've learned how to come back because you don't, you don't learn by internally failing, you know, a brain surgeon, when someone's trained to be a brain surgeon, they're not given a scalpel Oh, that, right, there you go, cut that. Oh, you killed him. Oh, well, here's the next one. Try again. Oh, you've killed him. Too. Oh, there's the next one. It's ridiculous. You're laughing because you're like, it's ridiculous. But that's what people do with their dogs. They're like, oh, I'll take them off. Oh, they're not coming back. Oh, I'll let them off again. Oh, they're not coming back. Oh, I'll let them off again. Oh, they're chasing a deer and not coming back. Oh, I'll let them off again. Oh, they killed a sheep and not coming back. It's like, at what point does that, you know, compute to people? It's like, there's something you're doing isn't quite right. And if you look at all the people with good dogs, they drip feed their freedom and they drip feed them. And, and I, to quote somebody else that I listen to, you know, that when they're bringing up, when you're bringing up a child, they're on a rope. OK, and the older your child gets and the more trust you have in them, the more you let the rope go. And eventually you curl up the rope and you hand it to them and go, I've done my pat them on the back, say, I've done my job. Now it's your turn. OK, and that's basically what we do with the dog. We allow them more and more freedom as they as they show they're capable of it. And and then as soon as they show any sort of like, oh, I'm going to screw this up, we rein them back in again and, and start drip feeding them. So when I say don't walk your dog, what I mean is basically don't walk your dog when in situations that you shouldn't be in with that dog at that level of training. Um, 
and don't feel that that is the priority for the dog. The priority is to get the dog trained. The dog is not going to die if it doesn't walk, doesn't go for dog walks, but it is going to die if you don't train it because it's going to get run over. It's going to get shot by a farmer. It's going to do something stupid. It's going to be put down because it attacked someone, you know, whatever, whatever. There's so many options for that dog to be, to have to be, you know, euthanized for whatever reason, because you haven't trained it how to do it. What do you make of the recent rise of uh, Cocker Spaniels? Like, as a family pet, everyone in the last few years has kind of gone, gone mad over them. But they are a very high energy yeah. breed. But a lot of people are getting them because they're cute. Do you know, how are you – are you coming across a lot of people who are like, oh, my goodness, it just, like, it just it goes into the bushes all the time. It's just constantly after prey. Like, what? Help me, help me. Yeah, p- people come to me all the time. They go, oh, I've got a Cocker Spaniel. It's got a high prey drive. And I'm like, no, no, you've got a Cocker Spaniel. Uh, and they're and they're like oh yeah but it's got a high prey drive i'm like no it's just that's like oh i've got a child and it's got an appetite well you'd hope so otherwise it's gonna die you know it, 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 it's just part of what they are you know they are and so people see them and they go oh they're quite cute they're really cute i mean i've got loads of them i love them um they are cute they're really cute and they know how to they know how to press your buttons they know how to be like oh look at me aren't i cute um but they also know how to do that and run off um <laughs> So um, we also get a lot of people going, oh, yeah, so we thought about a Labrador, but we thought we'd get a Cocker because they're smaller. And, <laughs> and maybe people have this preconceived idea of a sort of showbred Labrador male who's like 40 kilos versus a working Cocker who's 12 kilos. And they're like, oh, it's just so much easier. And it's like, I mean, I had, I've had people come to me like, oh, yeah, I want to get my mother a dog. My mother's 75. And I thought I'd get her a Cocker because a Labrador would be too big. I'm like... Cocker's going to break her hip more than a Labrador is because it's going to pull her over. It's, it's, you know, they take so much more training. They're not in they take so much more training uh, to get them to behave. And, I, and the other thing I say to people, like, apart from that, like four hours a year where you drive from your holiday from Hampshire to Cornwall and you've got three kids in the back and you've got canoes on the roof and your boots absolutely chocker with all the stuff we all take on holiday with us, paddle boards and wetsuits and whatever else and the dog's got to sit in the footwell of the passenger seat of the car for four hours yeah a cocker's going to fit in there better than a labrador but when you get there and you're on the campsite the cocker's then still in the passenger footwell or it's tied up or it's in a cage whereas the labrador's just kind of lying in the boot of the car with the boot open or it's lying in the tent with the kids and it's not running off into the undergrowth chasing rabbits and stuff um and and people just, I think people don't see the kind of the bigger picture. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to train it, though. I'm like, oh, yeah, are you? Yeah, I mean, we see so much success with that. And I'm being very cynical. But, I mean, we had someone here the other day who turned up with a, it wasn't a cocker. It was a, it was a German wirehead pointer. And this thing hauled him out the back of the car. A huge, great dog. Um, and I said, what are you hoping to achieve with it? And he basically did a list for me. Calm in the house, walking to heel, coming back and it's called. I was like, you've just listed a Labrador. And he said, yeah, yeah, but I thought with training, and I, was, I interrupted him, I said, what, you thought with training you could turn, I could help you turn a German wirehead pointer into a Labrador? I was like, no. I was like, if, if that was the case, there wouldn't be any dog breeds. There would just be dogs. And then we'd wake up in the morning and we'd go, right, of the eight puppies we've got, this one here is going to be a guide dog. This one here is going to be a family pet. This oh. one here is going to be a gun dog. This one here is going to be a sheep dog. And we would just train them accordingly. But no, they've been bred for hundreds of years for their to fulfill a specific role and, and, and to suddenly say to that dog, oh yeah, you're a Labrador, you're not allowed to pick things up or a Cocker Spaniel, you're not allowed to be, have enthusiasm for chasing game or a sheep dog, you're not allowed to look at sheep. It's, it's just kind of, it's just like, come on guys, get a grip. Um, you know, this particular person was like a lawyer or something in Edinburgh and you're like, you know, you're an, you're, you're, you're an intelligent person, you know, you, you, you should like put some thought into it. Like what were these dogs for? You know, we get the same with, People ring me up because they think a beagle, because I train gun dogs, they think I'm going to be help them with a beagle because it's a sort of hound dog. You know, they think, oh, well, it's all hunting. It's all the same. And I like, so tell me about your dog. And they're like, oh, it's great. It's great. And uh, what kind of dog is it? And I'm like, oh, it's a beagle. And they're like, oh, so it's great until you open the door. And like, yeah, yeah. And then it runs off. I'm like, but that's what it's been meant. That's what it's been bred to do for 200 years, to put its nose on the ground and take off after a scent. And if it was a dog in all those years of hunting of hunting foxes and whatever else they were used for in all those years, if that dog had just been one that gave up, it wouldn't have been bred for him. It would have literally been knocked on the head. The hunts, the hounds, the, 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 the huntsman would have been like, well, that dog's no use. 
Stock it on the head. Not going to breed off that. So they've they've got dogs that are ge- genetically off these like superhero dogs. Um, you know, not off sort of lazy kind of like layabouts. So so yeah, you just need to people just need to think about what they're taking on. And I I would you know we sell cocker spaniels to people, but we God we give them a grilling before they when they come. We're like, do you, you know what you're taking on? And we get a an army of them out. And I'm like, these ones are really well behaved and look at them. And they're like, like little flies over a, like flies over horse shit, you know, everywhere. And we take them out into a field and they're whizzing everywhere and everything's a hundred miles an hour. And they're like, Oh, but look, they're so energetic. I'm like, and these guys have taken two years to train. How does that work? Cause you're breeding a lot of them, as you said, for family dogs with whom go out shooting, you know, half a dozen, a dozen times a year yeah. then you said you give them an extra grilling but what extra training are you having to put into them or are you very selective in who you sell them to yeah so so if someone comes to me and says we're thinking about a cocker or a lab i just say labrador they've got to come <laughs> to me if someone comes to me and they are over that being ageist but they're probably over 65 and they say oh we want a cocker i'm like only if it's fully only if it's a trained one uh i mean i've seen people come for lessons oh this this these people sold my mother a dog the mother mother turns up and she's got her, her walking stick. She's 75 and she's got a one-year-old cocker and she's having trouble with it. And you're kind of like, and she's, oh, but I had cockers, <laughs> I had cockers years ago. And I'm like, yeah, but you didn't have a stick years ago. You know, it's it's kind of we've we've got to be, you know, and I'm pretty blunt to people and probably pretty rude to people. I don't see it as being rude, I just see it as being as being honest. So so um the first thing is is with our cocker spaniels, we are breeding them to be as calm as possible. So we are really thinking about what we're breeding and we have been for 10 plus generations. And, um, you know, so if you're going to get a cocker and you've got to think, you know, what, who am I going to get it from and what purpose is it going to fulfill? If I'm going to get a cocker spaniel for winning a field trial, then go and get it off a guy who breeds for field trials because that'd be awesome. But if you want a cocker spaniel that you want to be a calm like family dog and might do a bit of shooting, then get it off someone who's breeding them to be calm family dogs who are going to do a bit of shooting. Not to someone who's got a family dog who they decide to use the latest champion dog or whatever, which is sort of seemingly what happens. Always oh, got a great pedigree. I mean, do, do you know anything about those pedigrees? You ever been to a field trial? Like, it's just a lack of, like everything else, I'm afraid, it's just sort of lack of knowledge. And it's a real shame because you see people ending up with like, in all sorts of trouble with these dogs that they just can't handle because they've just got the wrong dog. So we're trying to make them calmer. We're, we're also, yeah, we're just, we are quite particular. Like if someone comes to us and goes, oh yeah, so I want a dog and this is where I live. I'd be like, sorry, you just don't have the setup for a, for a, a young cocker. It's just not going to work. We had a really nice couple from Edinburgh come to see us and, you know, both lovely people, smart people, good job, good attitude, good, like everything was lined up. They're like, oh, we, so we, we live in a flat where we are going to buy We are looking to buy a house. I'm like, great. Give me a shout when you bought a house with a decent garden. Um, because until then I'm not selling you a dog. Um, and I guess it's just, I've got high standards, but because I've got a, you know, reputation for what I do, then, then I can have high standards. And I guess it goes back to people who are breeding dogs, you know, and they have great intentions of only selling them to the best homes. And then they suddenly have got, five puppies at eight nine weeks old who are destroying their house and they just want them out the door um and you know the answer is well they shouldn't have bred them in the first place because you can't just it's very selfish to breed a dog because you want one of them because you've got to think well who else is going to have them who else are, whereas we are constantly thinking we are breeding these dogs for other people and that's one of the misconceptions i guess of like people who do it professionally is is we're thinking about you guys we're thinking about everybody else when we're breeding them whereas if you breed your own dog you're thinking about yourself and then that's it you're like oh i really like her but she whines and she she's a pain and she doesn't listen and she's got in like bad eyes and you know whatever else oh but i really like her she's sweet like well that's not a reason that to us that's not a good enough reason to breed breed your dog so i think more thought needs to go in from from people to breed their dogs and this is partly why we don't we have stud dogs but we don't kind of promote our stud dogs because i just see i've over the years i've seen too many people coming to me with dogs and i'm like you shouldn't be breeding off this dog and of course it's their beloved family dog and they get upset because this obnoxious guy tells them they shouldn't be breeding off it and it's just sort of like i just rather not have those conversations i'd rather not upset people so i tend to just kind of do my own thing and if someone comes to me with a dog i've trained or we've had something to do with and go, i really like to use one of your dogs i'll be like okay great but i would be 
doing that because I want one of the puppies or two of the puppies because I really like the mum and I think she should be bred from kind of thing. Does that, does that make sense? Completely. Okay, so we've got Labradors and we've got Cockers in the middle, Springers. What are your views on them as a sort of general pet slash working dog? Totally underrated. Um, Why so? They're just not in fashion at the moment. Um, you know, when I started doing this, there was, on an average year, there was 40,000 Labradors registered. There was 25,000, 20,000 Springers and five to 10,000 Cockers. And it's now 60,000 Labradors, 30 plus thousand Cockers and, you know, five to 10,000 litters of Springers. Um, if I had to have one dog, I'd have a Springer um, because they can have the on off switch of a Labrador. They are they want to get it right. Cockers quite often want to get it wrong. Springers are like, I'm going to try my hardest to get it right. Um, uh, even if they don't, they're trying. And and uh yeah they're just a bit of they're just a really good all-round a really good all-round dog um and I, I don't have enough of them i love them i love them and right now we don't we don't have a lot of them um and i miss them and we've just had a female come in season and i'm really looking forward to having a litter of springers again because they're 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 fun but but you know i also love cockers and i also love labs so i get the i get the i'm the lucky one who gets to have all of them and pick and choose um but no springers are, springers are great dogs and i think people have they're like, oh, Springers are more hyper. And I'm like, no, they're not. Again, get them from the right place. Get them from someone who's breeding good Springers and for the right purpose. And they're not. They're way easier to train than a Cocker. So speaking of training, you shouldn't give your dog treats. Why? I want a dog to do things because they want to work with me, not because how much I'm paying them. My, my team who work for me with the dogs, as in my human team, they do it because they love it. Yeah, I pay them. Of course I do, because um, they're great. But but they they don't come here for the they don't come and work here for the money. They do it because they love it. Uh, my kids, I don't walk around giving my kids pound coins endlessly when they whether they put their shoes on. They, I expect things of them. I want them to be part of you know part of our family. They have to empty the bins. They have to fill up the log baskets. You know, it's just it's just part of sort of daily life. So with terms of put that into dogs, and it's like if you're a really great little dog, yeah, I'll give you whatever you like. But I'm not giving you what you like to get you to become a good dog. So treat your dog because they're good, not to get them to be good. That's the that's basically the the sort of the main thing I try and get people to to do. I will take my kids on holidays and buy them presents because they're nice kids, not because I'm trying to get them to be nice kids. So where does praise then fall into that? So should there be reward through praise or do you have a different ulterior on that? Yeah, I mean we do, but we tend to like we don't we don't praise them every like 30 seconds unless they're little puppies and they're just learning things like like we're you know when we're talking to little puppies we're talking to toddlers oh well done you've put two lego blocks together why well, aren't you clever that's really great and that's how i talk to a 10 12 14 week old puppy oh you've followed me around you've got me a sock oh well done thank you because i want that i want that engagement i want that enthusiasm but as they grow it's more a case of well i you know, if my nine-year-old comes to me and goes, I put two Lego blocks together, I'd be a little bit like, oh, okay. You know, I'd be worried. Whereas if he came to me, Daddy, look, I built this huge fort. I'm like, that's awesome. Well done, you. So your level of expectation raises. And I think when people are training their dogs, they don't raise that expectation. They're, they're giving a dog a bit of praise or a biscuit when it sits, when it's a puppy, a tiny puppy, and that's fine. And then they don't then lift themselves and their dog out of that. So they're still doing that at 10 months old. I'm like, Surely by now you should expect your dog to sit when it's told. I mean, surely you've passed that stage. You know, surely it's house trained and it's got some level of obedience. Now we're looking to praise them when they do an awesome retrieve or they recall off like 10 other dogs or something. You know, then we're like, well done, you've done a great job. And then it's the enthusiasm of me and being with me, though. It's not like I'm enthusiastic about coming to you because you've got a sausage in your pocket. Because then they're doing it for the sausage, not for me. So the praise is fine, but it's coming from me, not from my pocket. But yeah, lift, keep lifting your expectations as you sort of pass, surpass levels. You need to be like, right, well, now th this is all expected down here. And now we're only doing praise for big things. So what we tend to do with sort of dogs that are in the sort of middle phase of their training around 10 months oldish, I guess, we would take them out for a training session. Yeah, we'll give them odd words of well done, heel, good dog. We're always talking to them in a nice, gentle voice. And then at the end, we might roll around on the grass with them and have a, like, a, like a play or something. But at the end of the training session, because they've done all the good bits and now it's like, right, let's have a play. 
rather than endlessly interrupting a training session by praising them. And then as soon as you praise them, they leap around, they start acting like a clown. If you take a maths teacher, okay, every time a kid gets a, gets a question right in maths and they're a 10 year old kid, they get a question right in maths or they get a, a word spelt right. The teacher doesn't go, right, let's all run out to the playground and tear around for five minutes. Okay, well done, yay, let's run around. Because then the teacher's got to then spend five minutes settling the kids down to get another question in. Whereas if they go, right, question, 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 question. Well done, everybody. You've done a really good job. You've all listened. You've all paid attention. So for five minutes at the end of the class, we're all just going to mess around or we're going to do something fun. It's a much more logical way of doing it. That's how we all do things in life. But for whatever reason, people can't do, can't translate that into the dogs. Uh, and it's really not, it's really not complicated. Like I, I always say to people, I'm not clever. It's not some sort of amazing kind of like, oh, I've got this magic wand to wave over your dog. It's really just very basic common sense. Everything we do. So apart from being probably the world's busiest man, if not Scotland's busiest man, what what does the future hold for Charlie Thornburn at Mordor Gun Dogs? Um, yeah, we've got a lot of plans. We are we're currently trying to. Um, so we built our kennels in two. I built my ken the kennels in two thousand and six. I bought a ruined farm, um, built the kennels, lived in a caravan, moved the dogs in, lived in a caravan, and then sort of slowly built the slowly built the house um, because you know. Um, training dogs isn't the sort of, you know, it's not like being an investment banker. You don't make a fortune. So it's very much a kind of case of sell a dog or train a dog, do a job or a train a dog, a couple of dogs for a guy. In one case, who had a concrete, fat concrete company. So I was like, right, I'll train your dog. Can you give me some concrete floors? Uh, just stuff like that. So, but the point is, is the kennels have been, they're busy. They've been busy all the time and we, we, we really need to rebuild them. You know, my stands are pretty high. So people come in, they go, oh, they're still really good kennels. I'm like, yeah, they're not, you know, they're not up to my standard. And also they're right next to my house. And I, my life has changed from when I started, when it was just me, uh, sort of redneck in the hills on my own. Now I've got, somehow I managed to get a lovely wife and two children. Um, so kind of want to move the dogs a little bit further away from, so I can have a little bit of, you know, um, a family home and and a business whereas it is totally merged into one and i mean on saturday we had 52 people visiting and my night my 10 year old kids doing car parking you know it's not really that can and they were all people visiting dogs dog training dog lessons coming to visit their dog coming to back getting a dog coming to visit a puppy whatever uh, it's not really a conducive way for a for a 10 year old to spend saturday afternoon although he did make a load of money out of it so he's not, <laughs> not that bad but yeah, so we want to completely rebuild the kennels. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to expand. We do a bit of boarding for dogs that have come from us. And obviously, the more dogs we've trained and sold, the more that there's a requirement for that. So we want to build a training kennel, a boarding kennel. We want to build a luxury boarding kennel. We want to build, we want to have our own vet practice on site. We, If we get the right place, we might have a dog daycare. We want to have some big training pens. We want to have more a better, bigger, better training facility, indoor training arena for like winter training and group lessons and stuff. Um, so basically it's sort of go big or go home. So that's kind of, that's very much at the forefront of my, my vision at the moment. And we're hoping to buy something this year, um, 2024 20, and get that underway. We've got a, a podcast starting in May, end of May which is um, I've just decided on the title. Uh, the, it's called The Good Dog Guide with Charlie Thorburn. Um, <laughs> so um, it's not necessarily about training. It's more about, you know, just information, a bit like we've been talking about today and me talking to vets and talking to dog food people and talking to places that you can go on holiday with your dog and just general like life about life, life with dogs and educating people more and more and to, to cover some of the points we've talked about with the breeding and the, the right dog for them and this sort of thing. We've also, we want to grow our, we want to grow our YouTube channel. It's done, it's done 10,000, up to 11,000 subscribers, I think in six months, it's done okay. Um, but I'd kind of like that to go much bigger because I, the more I can help people, the, the more, uh, the more satisfying it is. And we're also talking about um, expanding into a um, into another country. So, um, um, but we want to get the UK set up done right first. So, not being literally the world's busiest man. Uh, yeah, I mean, my wife might say so. Yeah, yeah, she says she gets tired just thinking about what I might be doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
But yeah. why? Yeah, why 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 can why the continual expansion? Why not just be on the farm with your X amount of dogs with a with a decent um, work life balance? I guess it's kind of a disease. Um always striving to do more. Um because I've got other things that I do as well, believe it or not. Uh um we've got a little property in property business that we do as well. Um We've got, uh, we helped uh, found a dog food business a few, uh, 18 months ago, and that's growing massively. Um, and I'm not involved day to day with that at the moment, but I, I might be further down the line and a couple of other things as well, which is, you know, so, so, you know, I just, I just like doing things. I like being busy and people kind of, people question me about it. And I guess, yeah, I, I you know, my, my mum says to me, my dad died when I was quite young, but my mum says to me, she has no idea where I get my work ethic from. Because she's like, you definitely didn't get it from me. Um, and she says, you know, your dad wasn't, la- my dad was a colonel in the army. She says he wasn't lazy at all. He was a, he was a worker, but he'd come home at five o'clock and he was like, that's me for the day. I'm now at home. Whereas I'm just on it all the time. And, and, and I, you know, I mean, i I've, there's two nights this week I haven't been to bed because we've been having puppies and and now I'm here doing this and then I'm off got a client arriving in 15 minutes and then I'm you know off doing various other things and we've got a client over from Switzerland for dinner and you know and then I'm driving down south on Wednesday for the day to get a dog mated and back again and I just thrive off I thrive off it um and um the thought of sitting around twiddling my thumbs for more than about four hours which just fills me with dread um <laughs> and i just think some people are just wired like that i, I don't know i can't explain it i am sure some clever person like jordan peterson or someone some psycho psycho analyst or whatever would be able to say that you know some people are just wired like that and i and i would never compare myself to you know richard branson or or elon musk or anyone um because they actually have a proper job and do proper things i just mess around with dogs but it's a similar kind of thing that you know why do they still do it why does Richard Branson still do what he does? And the guy's worth worth billions, and he's in his seventies, and he's got a lovely island in the in the Caribbean, you know. And yet he's still out there. He's still creating new things, doing new things. And I mean, I you know, you guarantee Elon Musk will be exactly the same when he's seventy five. He'll still be. He'll probably be the first guy to go to the moon, to go to the Mars or something. You know, who who knows? Um, but but there's just different people are wired differently because there's also people who sit around all day complaining, not doing anything. <laughs> You know, and I look at them and I go, how on earth could that be the, you know, your, your one shot at life? How can that be it? So I guess I want to cram as much in as I can. Um, and my, um, yeah, one of my friends pointed out the other day, my, my father's father was a serious war hero. He was in both the first world war and the second world war. Um, and was obviously a bit of a crazy guy, like reading some of the letters he wrote back to my grandmother. Um, he's one of the most highly decorated Scottish soldiers in history, he had two military crosses, two distinguished service orders like there they just aren't there isn't anyone else who's done that um so he obviously had a slightly like screw loose like why did he do that he refused a desk job to to because he wanted to be he said i've got too much even when he was getting a bit older in the second world war he says i've got too much battlefield experience you'd be i'd be wasted in whitehall and off he went and led the allied troops in from north africa into sicily and he and he got killed by a sniper like why did he do that just because he wanted to, he felt a need to do it. I think that's probably just me. I'm just not a hero. I'm just an idiot with some dogs, but I just like being busy. Uh, well, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and have this conversation. It's been, I think I probably laughed more in this podcast recording than any of my previous 40. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Charlie. For I, did say, I, did say, I did say I was an idiot, so I'm glad. You know, <laughs> keep someone amused. <laughs>